Okay, we're ready. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's health talk. Today, we're going to be talking about physical activity, physical exercise for everyone. We want everybody to feel like they can participate. We want them to feel like they're not excluded. Now, there's a lot of barriers to working out because of gyms being closed due to COVID, people feeling like they're not able to get out and join, and they're not able to do physical activities. So we wanna take the opportunity for you to learn from two, three experts today. So we're looking forward to learning from them. First, I want to explain uh, the Deaf Health Talks. We set these up every month. It's the third Tuesday from eight to 9 p.m. So please share uh, information with other people so that they can join. In the future, if you wanna contact us and give us some topics, that would be fine. So for March, the next month that we have, you'll learn more about the emergency department. There are two doctors who signed that will be explaining when it's appropriate or when it's not appropriate to go to the emergency department. If you want more information, please sign up and sign, uh, put your name in the chat. And there's a way you can sign up from that. Uh, link there. Now I want to introduce our three panelists. The first one is Jana Saranchi, who is deaf. She's a fitness instructor. She works at the YMCA. And then she also works, the other person that we have is Leslie Kang, who is also deaf. He's a coach who works at Gallaudet University. Uh, for Gallaudet University and also works at MSSD. And they'll both explain a little bit more about uh, women's uh, basketball, the key coach, coaches for women's basketball. Our third panelist is Dr. Okunlami, and he is the director for adaptive sports fitness, and he'll talk more about that. And he is including uh, some information about adaptive fitness for everyone. So Jana will go first. This is her sign name. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you all three for joining us today. Looking forward to learning more. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jana. I work at the YMCA in Rochester, New York. I'm a, as a personal trainer, I train clients. And I wanna say thank you for joining this discussion tonight. Um, so I want to let you know that after the discussion is finished, don't leave because Leslie and I, uh, the other panelists, will give you some demonstration, some fun exercises that you can do at home. We want to give you a disclaimer and let you know that the exercise that we're planning to show is something that you're taking on at your own risk. Next person. Hi, I'm Leslie Kang. I use he and him pronouns. Currently, I work at MSSD. I'm also an assistant uh, coach, uh, and I work for uh, strength and training uh, for classes uh, for students. I also work as an assistant coach as strength and training for uh, Gallaudet University to provide different uh, levels of activity and exercises for students. I also coach for women's basketball, so I have many different roles. Good evening, I'm Fermi Okunlami. I go by Dr. O. I am a young black man with a blue bow tie with polka dots, a blue shirt, a white, white coat. And in my background, you see white walls and some plants a colorful quilt. I use he, him, his pronouns and identify as physically disabled after having a spinal cord injury. I'm an assistant professor of family medicine, physical medicine and rehabilitation and neurology at Michigan Medicine. And for this talk, I am the interim director of services for students with disabilities and the director of adaptive sports and fitness at Michigan Medicine, which is trying to increase access to physical health and wellness for individuals with disabilities. I'm happy to be part of this team.
And people need to be careful to then give me time to talk because I will talk all day long if that needs to be the case. <laughs> but one thing I think is really important to note in this conversation is that I just came from a panel right before this where Yale medical students were talking about taking care of, of patients with disabilities. Now, I think that in the ableist world in which we live, people don't recognize disability and accessibility. And I love this panel because in this panel, there is an individual who is a spoken English interpreter for me, which feels different to people because in our world, accessibility is not always there. And so in the deaf and hard of hearing community, you, you're, that you speak American Sign Language and you're signing, and that is the norm in your space. And then in our spaces, we have to find interpreters to make sure that when we then have presentations like this, they are as accessible for everyone as they should be. So this is something that I can't wait to talk to people about because it's the shoe on the other foot for me to now be in this setting and being the individual that needed to be accommodated in a wonderful way. So I'm, I'm excited about this for multiple reasons. One more thing I would like to add. Um, if anybody wants to follow uh, my Instagram, I'm kangaroo. And I can give some information uh, uh, for the LGBTQ community as well. Safe works outs. If you want to get some information, you can talk with me directly on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. You can check out either one of those. Hello again. So what we're going to do is I will go ahead and ask the questions. We have a list of questions. So first, I want to learn a little bit more about your experiences as you grew up. Uh, did you grow up doing fitness activities? Were you involved in sports? Where did you learn and where did you get involved? So Jana, will you go first? Yeah, sure. So yes, I grew up um, in Maine and I started when really when my parents introduced me to sports, a lot of outdoor, outdoor activities and really got into that because of that. So I was involved in a lot of different sports in school as I grew up. I played basketball, soccer, indoor track, uh, cross country, uh, running, lots of different sports that I was involved in. I skied, I played badminton and tennis. Um, it really, I just love everything, any kind of physical movement. I love to be able to do that. And I love the feeling of uh, that adrenaline that my body gets, that energy surge I get, that always makes me feel good. So, yeah. Okay, and then King? Sure. So um, I grew up in... Uh, North Carolina, New Jersey, uh, New York City, um, went to high school and really was involved in a lot of sports. Um, I did for three years, I did uh, sports uh, outside and uh, basketball, did travel for different, sta uh, different states to play basketball. My senior year, um, but also like back up. So, um, and I will be open about this. Um, so I'm a transgender man now. But previous to that, when I was female, um, I played field hockey, basketball, track. Um, once I got into Gallaudet University, I played three sports. Um, not the whole time I was there. Um, for four years, I played basketball. For two years, I did track. And one year, I played football. So once I got out of there, um, 
I just really love that. I loved rugby and I started getting into that. So um, still love to do a lot of different sports and learn new things. Uh, softball, I was a pitch pitcher, uh, flag football, all kinds of different things. And I am involved in a lot of different things now because I think it just feels good. Um, I think it gives my body a lot of energy and it feels really good to get through all of that. And I like to do a lot of different things. Dr. O, would you go through your experience as you grew up, how you involved were involved with sports? Certainly. So like both of them, I've played sports all of my life. Uh, in high school and elementary school, I played basketball. I played soccer, lacrosse, track. I actually ended up at Stanford University where I ran track and field all four years. And I was an academic All-American. I was a captain of the Stanford's track team and considered training for the Olympics but then went straight to medical school instead. And I ended up having a spinal cord injury in my third year of orthopedic surgery residency, which then paralyzed me from my chest down with minimal use of my upper extremities. And so it was after that, that I was introduced to adaptive sports, which are primarily considered sports for people with physical disabilities. And many people didn't even know that that existed. People didn't know that if you were disabled, you could still participate in sports. People thought that if you had a physical disability that you were not going to be interested or able to play sports anymore. And that was something that I had never even heard of growing up. Yeah, thank you. So for many people, they're not sure where to go to do physical activity. Uh, I have a lot of patients now who are noticing weight gain because of COVID. And so I think it's important to learn some strategies on how to keep physically fit and maybe lose weight. So I'm curious about your favorite resources or different ways that you keep fit. Can you explain a little bit about what you're doing now and how you're managing uh, physical activity for COVID? So I'll have uh, Leslie start first. Sure. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier that I teach at MSSD for strength and conditioning classes. So I use my body as a lot of weight. Um, so, you know, resistance bands are really great. Um, you can be very creative. I can use a backpack with weight, uh, all kinds of different things. And so I give people ideas to keep them motivated. And then you know, as a staff person, me and the students, maybe we will work out together. And that really helps us stay motivated for, especially for this semester. It worked really well last semester. And now with the new semester, it seems like it's going very well. So it's tough to start if you haven't started, but then once you get going and you start to learn some of the vocabulary and how to eat and some of the nutritional things. Um, I also teach some health classes with another teacher so we teach some nutrition things in there too. And once people understand that, it really helps a lot. Okay, so Jana, do you mind responding? Yeah, I think for me, what I tend to do is I follow uh, active fitness app that I have on my phone. I don't know if people are, know, are aware of that, but it's really an awesome app. So there's a couple of, uh, people who started this organization and they provide four different exercises. Oh, wait a minute, four days every week, um, they will go through and change to some new programs every month for everybody to follow uh, through this app. So it's a really nice thing. There's videos, there's descriptions on the exercises that tell you how many sets and how many reps to do. So it's really A to Z, it's really great. And it's, there's a, a forum to support people to join so that we can help each other keep motivated and stay consistent. That's really awesome. The negative is that you have to pay $20 a month, but there are other resources out there for free. YouTube has a lot of, a huge long list of different exercise videos that you can do. If you just type in 30 minute uh, cardio exercise or something, you'll see a whole lot of options come up. Personally, I like um, the walk at home and pass fit. There's a body project uh, application. So it's really nice to have their closed captioned um, or integrated captioning. I like the closed captioning. The auto-generated uh, one is not so good, but sometimes they're tough, you know, YouTube, right? 
YouTube is really looking, you know, or you have to really search through there to find good uh, accessible videos. So not only that, but if you're at home and you don't have any equipment and you want to use your body weight, I would suggest doing some kind of movement, uh, deep cleaning your house at home, uh, playing with your pets or your kids, uh, mopping, vacuuming, if you do gardening, you know, shoveling, anything like that. There's a lot of things that you can do during advertisements on TV. You can get up and move around. Uh, find ways to be able to move, move your body a lot more, and that will help. Great, thanks. And Dr. O, could you tell a little bit more about your strategies and what you do? Yeah, so as you brought up at the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that a lot of gyms were closing and people would still need to have access to physical fitness. But as you know, my colleagues pointed out, there aren't a lot of accessible fitness options online. And so we actually tried to take a lot of these videos that people have seen online and we tried to put them into one place called Staying Fit While Staying Put that actually some of our interns over one of the summer programs that we do with Dr. McKee and I with them disability worked on putting some of those videos in one place. And I think that, you know, someone pointed out that maybe one or two of them weren't appropriately captioned, but all of them we were trying to make sure that they were as accessible as they were for people, no matter what disability you had, to then be able to try to stay fit, even if you had to stay inside during COVID. But the other exciting thing that we have right now is we've got wheelchair tennis that we've got, that we practice four to five days a week, and we're able to do so. We wear our masks and we have to get tested regularly. But part of our program is we have student athletes that are University of Michigan students that are competing in competitive sort of national level tennis. So I get to then spend time with them as well. And I have a nine-year-old son that I have to sort of wheel around all over the house to keep up with him so that I get my, my physical fitness and exercise that way too. And one more thing that I wanted to add. So it's not just that, uh, that I work at MSSD, um, do things through Zoom as well. But there's what uh, you had just mentioned about YouTube. Um, you can look for your Orange Theory uh, videos. There's, those are free to access. Usually I go through uh, a lot of times on Instagram. And so make sure that they're certified and is somebody that you can follow. If not, it's really at your own risk. Yes, that's a really good point. So some questions from the audience, um, for examples, uh, if you have a bad back, you have problems with pain, or uh, some people who have some activity limitations, some physical limitations. So can you go through and explain a little bit about what you would do to help accommodate somebody's abilities? If they have back problems or something like that, how do you uh, individualize your uh, fitness for people? So Dr. O, can you answer that first? Sure. Thanks, Dr. McKee. I think that one of the most important things is all of this should be specific to the individual. We all have different strengths and weaknesses and abilities, and it's just important that people find something that they're able to do, and then we, we make sure that we modify it. So for some people, they're not going to be standing up and doing a workout. They might not be on a treadmill. They might not be outside running. But as some people already said today, you can be in your house. You can even be on the couch. And if it's just moving your arms while you're on the couch, if it's stretching while you're on the couch or sitting on the floor, that is something that people can do. I think people think that you have to have a gym membership and go five days a week for two hours to then be able to be, to be active. And it's not that at all. I think that the most important thing is that it's something that you enjoy doing and that you will do regularly. Because sometimes people decide that they wanna get a complicated workout plan because they think that that's what they need to do, but then they don't keep up with it because they don't like it and it's not fun. So there are even video games that people can play that are you know, Wii and even some of the virtual reality things that people do. I think anything that you can enjoy that just gets your body moving is something that I think we can do. And so there are lots of specific examples, but I think if you just think of it as what do you like to do and what gets you moving, and that's something that can keep you active. 
Great, thank you. Yeah. Jana, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, I think one of the things that's so important is to get doctor's approval before you start with any kind of exercise program. Make sure that you're doing it safely and you know what kind of exercises that you can do and what made it, what kind of exercises you should avoid. A lot of exercises have uh, modifications. So for example, like push-ups. if you struggle with doing a full push-up, you can do something against the wall. You can do them from your knees. There's different levels that you can do. So if a full body push-up is the most advanced and harder, you can find other modifications that you can do that will fit whatever your needs are. So, and when you talk with a doctor, can you explain a little bit more about what to do? How do you let them know? Do you ask uh, the people who are your, your uh, clients to document or what kind of uh, information are you asking your clients to get from their doctor? From my experience, the clients tend to let me know what they already know, uh, what they've been told by their doctor and they just let me know uh, there's no specific forms or anything that I have them give to their doctor. And then Leslie, can you tell you more about your strategies too? Yeah, so, um, so I'm doing teaching for MSSD remotely. And so I tell my students in advance some things that we can't do. Like if you hurt your wrist, that's fine. We need to adjust things immediately so that we can uh, do things. So if anything, is impacting your workout and you can't do anything we have to have some modifications ready to go um, so not push them off to the side but make sure that they feel included and involved and can do whatever they are capable of so if somebody has a very serious issue then yeah then we tell them to go maybe to student services and talk with their doctor and then once they get that permission then they can let us know what we do and then we can modify so the point is really that it's important to communicate, have some uh, evaluation, talk with your doctor a little bit beforehand. So some questions about what to do, uh, what the process is, that was really helpful to know to what so people can ask their doctors. Yeah. So how do people stay motivated? Uh, sometimes people start and they get really excited yeah. to start working out and then they give up. So how do you help people maintain and work through that motivation so that they can get their fitness so, goals met? Uh, yeah. So Jana, can you answer that first? Sure, yeah, I actually have several things that I do. So first, I think it's really important to set up your goals and expectations. So um, the SMRT, SM, which is specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic, and T is time. So for example, for the S for specific, so say I'm gonna walk for 30 minutes, three days a week. Measurable means that 30 minutes uh, is consistent three days a week for one month. And if you're able to do that, the accomplishment um, is the A. And so that makes sense that you're capable. Is it something that I can do or is it too challenging? So with the R is realistic and time, can you succeed in that? Can you go through that for one month? Can I do that for three days a week for one month and then see how you do and see, is it realistic? Um, and then maybe you can set up more specific uh, goals and feel like, well, I'm able to achieve that. So, and I think for weight, uh, weight work goals, think about how you feel after you work out. Um, you know, you've released some endorphins after you exercise, it feels really good. You feel really energized and that's really helpful. And if you can remember that, why did you start doing this in the first place? What was your uh, goal to, that you were setting? And if you write down your SMART goals, maybe post them on your refrigerator or somewhere on your wall so that you can see them regularly and remember why you started that exercise program in the first place. I think it's also really important to have some uh, peer support, family and friends support, uh, get into contact with friends or family um, and support each other and let them know what you need. You know, maybe you can work out together. 
Um, you can do Zoom uh, exercises. I know a lot of people are stuck at home, but people do it through Zoom. And so that's nice. You don't necessarily have to go and work out in person with each other. Uh, Facebook has a lot of different groups that you can join. Um, there's a deaf fit group. Um, I'm sure hope many people are aware of that. So there's support groups that you can get from there. It's nice because it's deaf peers. You can talk uh, and sign. It's a lot of related to fitness things. But yeah, those are just some ideas that you, I threw out there. I also want to let you know that we'll share some resources. Uh, Kaya and Samantha will share some of the resources uh, on Facebook, some of the comments, um, some resources that are available. So we'd like if people want to learn more, um, we will put those on there. And then Leslie, go ahead. Yeah, so one of the things that you have to make sure to stay motivated is just be aware. For me, I try to post uh, wallpaper. I put it on my phone. So something like this. So this says, I came, I saw, I overcame. You know, so it's kind of like uh, Latin, you know, venti, vendi, vidi. So, you know, it's this idea that it's the same, like, how do I applying that? How do I do that for this specific thing that I'm doing? So, and that really helps to keep me motivated and keeps me going. And so it applies to me and I think it applies for mental health as well. So I appreciate uh, the deaf community, people here in Washington, DC, um, you know, that really all over the US who uh, send things uh, through Instagram, um, people who set up accounts and we talk to each other and we kind of encourage each other and say, let's go. I really like that. You know, here's what I think and here's what you should do. And um, everybody's kind of contributing and it's really helpful. So that really helps to keep me motivated. Even people are not there with me. It's great just to know that there's people are out there. Um, sometimes I go to the gym and I see people there and somebody says, can you stay with me? Cause I really need to stay motivated and stay, you know, lead you to push me. And so we don't do the same program maybe, but just check in with them to make sure that they're doing it. Here at MSSD is really great because we uh, reinforce each other a lot through Zoom classes and keep each other motivated and push each other. And we know that we'll feel good later if we keep doing it. Dr. O, can you go through a little bit more? Yes, I think that what both of them said is amazing. And having an accountability partner or someone that can sort of keep pushing you. But I think one thing that I'll add, just because they gave such perfect answers, is that you can find a lot of people to support you online, but you can also find a lot of people that are tearing you down. So I think it's important to make sure that what you're connected to online is then positive. You don't want to then look at something and think, oh, I want to look like that and I am not good because I see that on social media and that is what media says is healthy. That's what media says is important. And so I think it's also really important to then know, as, as, as Jenna was saying, what your goals are and make sure that the people that you have around you build you up and that you don't see things on social media that then are creating this image of what people think health is, of what people think staying fit is, that isn't, isn't necessarily normal or right, right? I think there are, there are images that are out there is are what people think it looks like to be healthy, but we all have different body shapes and types. And as a, as a primary care physician, the goal for me is not a certain weight. The goal for me is not a certain body type. It's not a certain dress size. It's that you have healthy practices that you can then do consistently and then feel good about what you're doing. And so having those right people around you to then keep pouring into you positively and making sure that it's not a stressful thing, a negative thing that's then motivating you, but it's a positive goal to then make sure that you're staying healthy and then not that you're just going for some sort of a look that might not actually be a healthy look for you. Yeah, right. You... Next question. Um, Want to know what your thoughts are? Why do you stay fit? Why do you think that's so important? And what kind of impact do you think it has on your health? So Dr. O, can you start? Yeah, Dr. McKee, I think that's a great follow-up question because I think that staying fit 
looks different to different people, right? And we, we all have sort of a, a different fit shape that that may look like, but from a, a physician standpoint, it's important because for our heart health, for our body health, and for our mental health, being able to stay fit is something that is going to benefit all of those things, right? And so if you particular, let's say you have a physical disability, for me, I know that if I don't stay fit, it's going to be harder for me even just to get around and do my daily activities of living, right? And so if I'm not staying active, you know, it'll be harder for me even just to transfer from my bed to my chair. It'll be harder for me to get in and out of my car. It'll be harder for me to just, you know, even to cook because if I'm not moving around and I'm not active, you know, it's difficult for me using a wheelchair, getting things around in my house. And if I'm not actively staying fit, then those things that are important. And as I said earlier, playing with my son, it's harder for me to do when I'm not fit, when I'm not healthy, when I'm not staying active and exercising, I'm not able to be there for my nine-year-old the way that I know I want to be. You know, it's not the same as trying to keep up with all these 19 and 20-year-olds on the tennis court. And I, I don't try to do that anymore as much. I try, doesn't mean I do, but it's my nine-year-old that I want to be around for longer. And that's what, you know, staying healthy and fit and active, I think that is what it's important for. It's not so much to then have a particular look, it's really to then be healthy mentally and physically. Great. Leslie. Sure. Um, fitness, I think, is so important to me because I know that I've had some health issues, uh, mental health issues. Um, I have asthma, uh, not terribly serious, but moderate. Um, and so I know I have to keep myself fit in order to just keep going. And that helps me feel good. So I was uh, very overweight. I was very obese and I've lost a lot of weight. And I know that that's something that really helps to keep me motivated because I feel so much better than I did before. So I've gotten rid of that old mindset and I think about the future and I look forward to uh, doing that and not going back to where I was. And I think that's why fitness is so important to me. Yeah, Jana. To me, uh, to stay fit and stay healthy means a lifestyle. Um, it, you know, it should be part of your lifestyle, which means that you're going to do it for the rest of your life. So exercise, movement, I think is so important. What you eat and how much you sleep, that's part of your lifestyle. And I think exercise should be included in that. I think it's so important. And it's so important for your physical health. Uh, it helps you sleep better, you have better energy, your mood is better, and your body just overall feels better when you're exercising. Yeah, I know for me, if I'm out, if I'm playing with my family, it just moving around, it really helps me feel much better. You know, my mood, my spirit, my physical uh, feeling. So yeah, yeah. And there's one other thing I wanted to add. Um, so when and if MSSD opens again, I'm looking forward to being able to play basketball with students because that's another thing that helps to bond with the students and stay fit. So sometimes we go play basketball, you know, once COVID stopped everything, um, you know, we used to go on field trips or we'd go out for walks. Um, and I'm looking forward to being able to do those things again. That's another way to keep fit. Question. So next question. So what if exercise is something new to you? Um, you hadn't, you used to do it, but that you're not doing it now. So where do you start? How do you start going again? Any recommendations for the first steps um, involving physical activity? So uh, Leslie first. Yeah, sure. I think you have to learn um, some very basic foundational things. Um, for example, things that are not too advanced, you don't want anything that's too complicated, um, start with baby steps, do something smaller and then build. It's not going to be boring because you'll be benefiting so much in ways that you don't even realize. So I do HIIT and so I think it's a good way, can you explain what that is? 
so that's more of a like, sorry, um, it's a high intensity uh, exercise, almost like a CrossFit program. So you're doing a lot of uh, exercise, high intensity, but it's very basic exercises, 30 minutes and that's it. And so you build up from there. And then once you can start doing that, you know, that's kind of a phase one. Once you get accustomed to doing that, you move up to a second phase. And then you can see, oh, I see my strength is really developing and my cardio is, my condition is developing. So, you know, it's not gonna be something that you do right away. So you don't, it's better to do it slowly and be patient and move through it and then build up your fitness. And I think you'll be happy later. Jana, can you go ahead and explain your thoughts? Yeah, two things I want to explain. The first one is that uh, as a personal trainer, uh, working with clients who are new to fitness and exercise, I tend to start with some of the, the first session is just kind of a description of um, hinge, pull, and push. So I tend to start uh, teaching uh, deadlifts. Uh, that's a kind of a hinge movement for your hips, squats, and uh, push-ups, uh, push and pulls. So it's just some basic ideas for each of them, some strong foundation for uh, skeletal fitness for the future. And some people say, oh, I want to, you know, do some heavier weights. And I say, not yet. It's really good. You want to make sure that you get your form set first, and then you can increase your weight because you don't want to hurt yourself. And then the second thing uh, that I tell people, you know, if you don't want to do a personal trainer, then you can just start off slowly, you know, walk three days, four days a week. Um, if you're already walking, maybe increase how much you're going, uh, the distance or the uh, time that you're walking. If you have not done a lot of exercise, then I would suggest you start walking something very simple, very basic, three days, four days a week, maybe 20 minutes per day. But it's important that you get to the point where you're starting to feel warm. You maybe get a little bit sweaty, you can feel your heart rate going up, and that counts. And then from there, you can just work up to be something, to do something more challenging. I agree. The goal is to start slow, feel comfortable, learn what you're doing. You know, there's a lot of resources out there that people can check into. I think it's important that you encourage people to build. You know, sometimes my patients ask, how much is enough? So, for example, walking, you know, if you're not doing anything, that's a good place to start. But the goal, of course, is 10,000 steps a day, which is a good goal. So, you know, that's usually enough. But for muscle strength, um, I think what you're mentioning is really helpful. How long should I continue my fitness activity? You know, we're talking about the 10,000 steps, but can you give some other examples of exercises? Say how many minutes um, can you explain a little bit of the uh, different time for different activities and how many days a week should you take breaks um, every so often? Should you work out every day? So I think, Jana, go ahead and start. Yeah, it, it really depends on my client, my person, and really what their goals are. And from there, then I can start to make some specific recommendations. Some clients want uh, more cardio. Um, and so we can set a program for them. Some people want to work on balance. And so we can accommodate some things for them. Um, people want to practice agility or strength. So it really depends on their goals. So for example, if I have a client who wants to increase their strength, uh, which means they want to lift weights maybe three days a week or four days a week. So maybe an hour max, really, that's all you need. You don't need to do several hours in the gym. And then you need to include some cardio in the mix as well. Yeah, yeah, so cardio for your heart. It really depends. Um, I think overall, the rule of thumb is to start with about 150 minutes a week. So, which means about a half an hour for five days a week. And again, it really depends on the person and what their goals are. Great, thank you. And Leslie.
Yeah, I think uh, what Janet just mentioned is right on. Um, I think that's the good answer. For my uh, students right now, what it looks like is we uh, exercise two times a week. Uh, for myself, my own uh, personal exercise. Well, actually, I'm going to go back to the students. So they average about 30 minutes two times a week. And then they can add 10 minutes of stretching, which is really important for cool down because a lot of the uh, teams, what they do is uh, we're doing Zoom through classes all day. And so what I try to do is I make sure that I talk about uh, hip stretches, um, neck stretches, take a break from your eyes, you know, hands if people are sitting at the computer all the time. So take some breaks and do some stretching. I think that's really important for this. So for my personal uh, fitness regimen, I do five days a week. Um, but whatever your uh, preference is. So for me, I like five days a week, but I split it out. So I don't necessarily do Monday through Friday. Um, maybe I'll do a workout different on Wednesday from Thursday, one upper body day, one lower body day, uh, some push uh, exercises or pull exercises. So really, again, it depends on your goal. My goal, you know, all of our goals are to be effective and do what you want to be able to do. So it's same thing with nutrition. You know, if you want more protein um, or if you need more carbs or whatever it is, um, if you want to be more lean, then you're just what you're eating. And then calories are all important things that you have to look at. So again, it's just, um, you have to think about what your goals are and everybody's going to be different. Yeah, we will talk about nutrition a little bit as well. Dr. O, can you respond? Yeah, I think that all of this is great. And I think that, you know, for some people, even thinking about two times a week, a, a workout plan or 150 minutes a week, sometimes that can even feel like a lot. So what I tell people sometimes is, you know, some simple things, if you usually check your mail, right, when you're driving up the driveway, I tell people walk to your mailbox instead to get your mail. If people usually take the elevator and you have the ability to then take the stairs, I tell people take the stairs if you can take the stairs, right? So there's some things that you can start without having to have a formal fitness program that you just, as they said, sort of start low, go slow, walking up the stairs, walking around your house. And then for some of us with, with some more physical mobility disabilities, really just stretching and getting out of your chair, if you use a wheelchair, stretching your legs, Sometimes, you know, people have different types of devices that can maybe a, a standing frame chair to then be able to get up and then stretched outright because your hip flexors and your quads and your hamstrings and your calves can get really tight if you're not moving around and if you're in your chair all the time. And so even just getting up and out of the chair and stretching, that is something that will, will help you because if you're not active that much and you're just getting started, and you try to do 150 minutes a week at the beginning, right? You're you're gonna you're gonna be hurting. And so I think that just trying to find something that you can start with, even if it's stretching in your house and and deciding like some of us we might use walker or crutches at times, but because for me at least it's it's easier and it's more efficient to get around in my house in my chair. But when I decide, you know what, one day this week I'm gonna use my walker inside the house. It might take me longer to get things done, but at least then I'm getting upright a little bit more and that's at least staying a little bit more active or you know, a little bit more fit. So I think that those are, for some people that aren't sure where to start, there, there's some simple things that you can do that might not require a gym, might not require you know, a, a set sort of exercise plan, but it's just trying to be more active even within your home. Great. So I want to um, wrap up this and talk to uh, some of the audience questions. Um, and then we're going to do some demonstration for some exercises at the end. So the first question that came in is, how do you manage um, if you have uh, an, an invisible disability? Something like, so I'm deaf, or if somebody has traumatic brain injury, or how do you manage things like that? 
Um, you know, I grew up deaf and I was playing sports, and sometimes I can't hear what's going on on the other side of swimming. Um, I'm supposed to tap my foot, and sometimes I get a false alarm and I just take off because I thought that I was supposed to go. And so I'm the only one out there swimming. And so I was exhausted and I have to go back and start again. So what, how do you manage things like that? Can you go through and explain? Um, so I don't know. Um, Leslie, I think you can go first. Sure, uh, that's fine. Um, I think it's really a great question. So I think that relates to what you were saying, like TBI, um, or uh, I think it really can be a challenge to um, continue to just work out and be positive. I know it's not easy to say just be positive, but um, it's important that you have support and have a good support system, people maybe to work out with you. I think that's it. Uh, I guess I, I don't know if I can fully answer that question. I think, um, Jen, I think it's Dr. And Jenna, I think you next and then Dr. O. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the order that I've been in. Yeah, what you were just saying, Mike, about swimming, you know, getting a false start and then taking off. That happened. Uh, I had an experience. Um, I had mentioned that I was in track um, and I would do the hurdles. Um, and then one day uh, I had a competition that was on a Saturday. And so I was running a five, 55 meter dash, uh, just a direct, you know, there was five or six hurdles that I had to clear. And so, you know, they have the gun to start uh, and everybody would get going. And so if they do the second one, that was a false start. And so that happened to me and I had just started and I heard the first one. And so I took off. And then I didn't realize I didn't hear the second one. And so I just kept going and I was running and I got all the way through and I thought, oh great, I got first place because nobody else is behind me. And I just kept going. And I got there at the end and I looked back and I thought, oh, oops, I didn't know that. And so it was really embarrassing. And another, the other team said like, what's the matter with that girl? Why did she just take off? And the teammates, my teammates said, you know, she's deaf. And that experience was really uh, kind of challenging for me. It was kind of embarrassing. So I know Dr. O. Oh, and then Dr. O, oh, um, I know you manage the adaptive uh, fitness. So what, what do you think? Yeah, these are, are great questions. And there are actually ways that within sort of adaptive sport and Paralympic sport that this is, this is addressed. So I was actually just commenting on an article about this earlier because with the gun that goes off, if once again, if you are deaf or hard of hearing, you may not hear that gun. So what we actually do is we have visual cues that then go simultaneous with the gun. And so then when there's that visual cue, that's what, and, and we try to make sure that it's as close to time as possible because you don't want to then disadvantage the person that's using the visual cue. And so the visual cue goes at the same time as the audible cue. And then everyone will know if they hear the second gun because there are people that we have entirely sort of Paralympic sport that if they're individuals that have you know, different disability types, we have to make sure that it's access accessible for every person that's competing. And so I think that's the beautiful thing about adaptive sport is that it is automatically recognizing that the human existence, the human experience has a variety of ability, right? There'll be people that are deaf or hard of hearing, people that are blind or low vision, people that have amputations. And then the person was asking a question about sort of traumatic brain injury or you know, mental health disabilities. And, and everyone should then be sort of accommodated and meet, make sure that we have what's there. And so I think oftentimes people would bring up the, the Special Olympics in this conversation because there are organizations that are for individuals with you know, intellectual or developmental disabilities which oftentimes, you know, if you have a traumatic brain injury, you know, that can then feel like sort of a, an intellectual developmental disability. And the way that we provide sort of the supports for, you know, providing access to sport, there are special Olympic organizations that then help make sure that all of the sort of the supports that are needed to be able to understand what you're doing or just allow someone to participate. You know, there are, there are lots of different organizations that provide that too. So there's something for everyone. 
Great. Jenna, did you have something you wanted to add too? Yeah, one thing I did want to add uh, for personal training one on one, um, some clients have some mental health issues or some other things, stress, anxiety. Um, and then does that mean I just train um, with a person? No, I, I actually train the whole person because, you know, I have people I have connections with and we interact and we work out, but at the same time we have conversations. So sometimes people have stressful days at work and they get to the gym and they feel really ready to work out and they like that and they are able to talk and it helps them kind of de-stress. So I think that can really be helpful for mental stress as well. Leslie, yeah, I, I have two thoughts that I was thinking about um, to answer this question. One I had forgotten about, but it came back. So as I was talking about basketball, I played when I was younger, when I was in middle school. Um, you know, if they were going to call a timeout or a foul on me or something, and I didn't know, and I was just kind of going through to the basket, and I would be embarrassed because I'd look back and say, oh, okay. And yeah, you know, sometimes you're right, Jana, what you were talking about, some people would say like, what's the matter with that guy, you know, that this person doesn't know what they're doing. And people would say, you know, he's deaf, she's deaf. So that's, you know, good support from the team. And the other thing that I thought about currently, one of the things that I do is that I have a, a client who's also trans. And so I want to make sure that they have a safe zone and understand that you know, there's sometimes you can have mental health issues and there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. And so we should still be able to be able to work out. And it really helps with the bonds um, and support with people. If you see people who are the same, then it's really helpful to have that support because they understand what you're going through. Um, so it's really helpful for the LGBTQ plus community um, and including uh, transgender people uh, helps with their mental health, how we stay supported and uh, fit with each other. Um, there's things that are available for people. We have so another good question that came um, in. What, how do you manage if the person uh, is really struggling with ongoing pain, uh, somebody who has maybe arthritis, how do you manage uh, fitness? I know uh, what I would do is uh, encourage people to move um, to make them feel better. But can you explain uh, some of your experience? How do you start you know, from somebody who has pain and help them move through that or make some recommendations to help them uh, feel better? So I think maybe Dr. O is supposed to go first. So I was going to piggyback on what Leslie said for the last question too and say, I think that, you know, you know, being able to then have people that are like you, that look like you is super important, but I think it's always also equally important to then make sure that those of us that may not look like you or those of us that may not know are accepting or welcoming of people that are not like us too. I think that we, we want to then support ourselves, but if we then get other people to recognize that we need to support each other, and that we need to support people that don't look just like us too, that then we'll get to a place where, you know, people will feel more welcome and more included in more spaces because everyone in general is being more welcoming and more inclusive. And so I think that that's, you know, a really good thing. And, and it starts, right, unfortunately too often, it usually starts with the people that are similar. And we know that we, we sort of want to stay in our spaces where people know us and where we're comfortable, but it's also on the rest of us to make sure that we are, welcoming of others, right? Like you all let me join Deaf Health Talks and I'm not deaf. And so this gives an opportunity to invite someone in that's not like you to then see that we're actually more similar than we even know, right? We can connect on physical fitness even if we don't have the same thing that we feel like connects us. And so I think that's really important and I'm glad that you're, you're talking about that because if we don't recognize how other people are feeling excluded often, we then don't always sort of, you know, extend a hand to then realize what we can do to just be more welcoming, to be understanding, to be inclusive, and to know that we all have differences in some way, but differences in bad. 
And just because someone is different than you doesn't mean that they are less than you. And that's really important. So I think you know, that's something that really even like team sports can then show, which is why I think it's really important for even as kids are coming up, that they have an opportunity to be able to be fit and play sports and be active. So I know that that was a, a different question, but I just wanted to make sure that that was something that we could touch on in terms of all of us. You know, we say this is physical fitness for all, and we can all support each other in being able to create access for all of us to be able to have that physical fitness. But then I guess Dr. McKee asked me a direct question. Now I even forgot what he even asked me to answer. Oh, we'll start with Kang. So yeah, I think what you said, uh, Dr. O was great. I thought that was a great explanation. And then related to the pain and how to deal with that, um, how to support, I encourage people to try and avoid, uh, you know, sometimes people can't go to the doctor because they can't afford a regular checkup. And so I think it's important to check your fitness instructor has certification, look at organizations that they belong to, um, anything related to fitness and health education, get some ideas on how to uh, stretch, you know, the R-I-C-E uh, acronym. So R is uh, to recover, um, ice, cardio. Uh, if you have, you know, some pain on your leg or something like that, ice it and elevate it. Um, so I think if you go to see your doctor or a physical therapist, uh, or an occupational therapist, please follow their instructions. Um, and it takes a lot of patience. The key is patience. I know people are in a hurry to get better, but I think it's, you want to go slow and you follow what they say so that you can get better. Jana said, yes, Dr. O and, uh, Leslie said everything. So I think one of the things that I would add to that is as a personal trainer, talking with clients, if they have a specific uh, injury or pain in a certain area, I try to think of some different exercises that might target that specifically, that uh, body point or potentially avoid that because I don't want them to be more injured. And if something does happen where they feel injured, maybe we'll reduce the weight or uh, reduce the range of motion that they use for a particular exercise. So maybe they don't go down full in a full knee bend, they just do a partial knee bend. And that's maybe less impact um, on the injured area, or maybe just stop, don't do that exercise at all. Find some other exercise, some other alternative. I'm gonna, um... So now we're gonna switch over to the demonstration, uh, talk about some different exercises. Before we uh, go ahead and get ready with that, uh, Jana and Liz, um, I want to explain a couple of things. One is that if you're, these are demonstrations for exercises, but we want to let you know that participation in this exercise um, has a potential for uh, injury. Um, we hope that doesn't happen, but it's important for us uh, to know that you're evaluating um, yourself for your own risk. If you feel like you're ready to do that, it's up to you. If you're not sure, please contact your doctor and see if you're able to do any of the exercises. So Jana and Leslie will show you some demonstrations in a minute. Another thing that's important to do is look at the resources that we have posted on Facebook. Uh, you can learn more. There's more opportunities to learn um, from your feedback. We have a survey there. It's done both in sign and English and Spanish. Um, so you can type, um, you know, if you wanna learn um, some experience from a deaf or hard of hearing person, or if you wanna learn, you know, um, when you're in uh, COVID times and you have some different issues that you wanna learn about, we wanna know what other people's uh, experiences are. And so we want to make sure that there's equity for people to join in and give feedback. So before we do the demonstration, please give some uh, feedback. If you have some ideas for future topics that you would like to hear covered on Deaf Health Talks, please share those. Sign up for our email. And if you want us to contact you in the future, it'll let you know about Health Talks. And we want to thank the people who have joined here, the volunteers, 
um, and everybody who's joined it. Stage. And finally, I want to say thank you to the interpreter, Christine, and uh, our captionist. So for making all of this access accessible. We have partnered with Michigan uh, Health. We also have a partnership uh, with Deaf Health. Those are the partners that we use uh, here at University of Michigan in the Department of Family Medicine. So thank you for all of them. Okay, so hopefully everybody's ready for the demonstration. Okay, great. Okay, so I hope everyone can see me. I know it's not full view. Can you see me all right? Okay. So we're gonna get started. I'll show you some examples. So the first thing I wanna do is explain about warm ups. Um, we have a list of 10 things that you should do for some warm ups, different kind of movements that you can do before you actually start your exercise program. So we'll demonstrate a couple of these really quick. We'll go through the list. So the first thing that you can do is just swing your arms and move back and forth. You're crossing your legs back and forth and you're crossing your upper body back and forth at the same time. So just movement and what that does, it gets your blood flowing through your body a little bit better, gets your heart rate to start to go up. The second thing that you can do is jog in place or step in place. If you would rather sit, you can do a seated knee raise while you're sitting, just lift your knees up, that's another possibility. Or you can jog in place, whatever fits your preference. Third thing for warm up is to do jumping jacks. So something like this. If that feels like it's too challenging for you, you can just step one leg out at a time. So instead of jumping, just lift one leg out to the side. If you're sitting, I'll show you the demonstration on how to do that. So one leg goes out, I wanna make sure that you can see. The legs go out to the side and your arms go up and overhead. That's another option. What else do I have here? You can do squats where you just bend down. Right, and so you wanna make sure that your knees stay behind your toes and you wanna make sure that your knees are parallel with your feet, however you're signing that, however you're signing feet. So bend down and make sure that your hips go back. The next thing that you have is lunges. So you can probably see Leslie because he's doing the full view there. So you can see, so your knee should be at 90 degrees bent. That's perfect. His form is great. So, and you can do something called skaters where you're just moving back and forth and you can see Leslie demonstrating that. So you don't have to jump, you just wanna step from one side to the other. Yep, just like that. Okay, and the next thing that we have on our list is walkouts. Can you show that on the, your floor? So like an inchworm, yep. There you go, yep, just like that. That's great. Okay, great, thank you. So burpees, do you wanna demonstrate those? Do you want a full one or? Yeah, so go ahead and try um, 
the full is with a push up and a jump. So yeah. So, and then show the easier version if you don't do the push up. And then there's another version that you can do. If it's challenging to do that, you can use a chair. And so you have a higher surface, so you don't have to go all the way down to the floor, that will make it easier. And another option is if you really struggle with it, you can do something like this. So that's another modification. Yeah, that's great. A high knee lift. So you, if that's too hard, you can just step as opposed to jog. Butt kicks is another one. The next thing um, we're gonna go and talk about are some of the demonstrations. So I'm gonna show you some fun things that you can do at home. So if you have a 15 ounce can of beans, that usually weighs about a pound. A two liter bottle of soda is about 4.4 pounds. A gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. If you wanna put more weight on there, you can fill it up with sand. So I'll show you some exercises that you can do with things that you have around the house. Cans up and overhead. These are just cans of beans. They're light, they're about one pound. You can use one liter bottles. So you could also use two liters and do overhead presses. If you're seated, it would look like this. The other thing that you could do is flies like this with one pound cans or tricep extensions. Another thing that you can do is with one liter bottles, just do some bicep curls. You can do extensions like this up and overhead for your triceps. You can do rows with a two liter bottles or with gallon jugs. Another thing that you can do is with a one gallon jug or two, two gallon, two one gallon jugs, do presses. Okay, we're almost finished. There's a lot of different things that you can do. You can do squats with a one gallon. You can do lunges with some weight. And you can also use a backpack, or if you don't have a backpack, you can just put whatever you have in there, something to add some weight while you're doing some squats or some lunges. You can also run or walk outside with some added weight. There's a lot of different varieties of things that you can do. It's nice to have a huge list of things. It's not just cans. You can find other things around the house, maybe a bucket. Uh, anything that you have that is weighty at home would be really great. Water. Um, or Gatorade or something like that, something that's heavy. Sometimes I carry a, a crate of something. Sometimes I use my dog to do squats or a baby or a kid. Yep, exactly. Be creative. Okay, so I think we're gonna wrap up with that and make sure that you don't forget to do a cool down stretch as well. Don't skip that part. Bye, thank you. All right, that's wonderful. Thank you. A lot of people have things already at home that they didn't even realize that they had that's equipment.
So I want to thank everyone for volunteering to explain about uh, fitness to the deaf and hard of hearing community. Just know that your behavior, your lifestyle, your choices that you make, how you exercise and how you eat all have an impact on your health. People think that, oh, you know, I have some genetic issues, something from my family, but you can eat and exercise and that really can improve your health. And I think these demonstrations are really helpful and I think they're really great tips. So before we close, I just wanna ask uh, Dr. O, um, if you have any other good ideas or wisdom to share uh, that uh, for physical activity to feel inclusive. Um, anything else that you wanna add about that? I think Jana and Leslie did a great job and they even gave some options for things that you could do if you were seated. So I think that that was just great, right? And they, they had things just around the house to be able to stay active. So I really think that these two are the experts here. So I was learning a lot this entire time. Thank you for letting me join you all. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah, we'll be talking next month uh, about the emergency department, uh, when to go, when not to go, uh, maybe to see another doctor, maybe contact your family doctor instead. So there will be uh, people who are signing. So we'll see you soon for that next thing. Thank you for everything, everyone. All right, take care and stay safe.